The Ben Heck Show is brought to you by Element 14, the electronic design community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com. Hello and welcome back to the Ben Heck Show. In a few months, we're going down to Austin, Texas for a Freescale Semiconductor event, and they'd like us to bring a cool project along with us. Well, we have a bunch of Teensy 3.1s laying around, and those are based off a Freescale product, so we thought, hey, this could be really good. But what to build? Then I remembered, I've always wanted to build a miniature half-scale pinball machine. I actually wanted to make one of these for Maker Faire like two or three years ago, but I never got around to it. But now we actually have the time since it's a few months away, so we're gonna give it a shot. The Team C 3.1 will be great because it's fairly beefy. It's 96 megahertz when overclocked. And we can run a lot of interrupts and also put a sound module on it too, so we can do everything with one Teensy. So we're gonna make everything about one half scale. It'll have electronic scoring and music, so we'll put like a old school LED score on the back of it. And it'll have like 16 switches, 16 coils maximum. It'll be pretty simple, but it should be fun. And the idea is that it'll be portable, so it'll run off batteries. We're going to do this project in two parts. Part one will be the electronics that make it run, and then part two will be the mechanical parts that actually comprise a pinball machine or a miniature pinball machine. So for the electronics, we're going to have a dual 16 channel constant current LED driver. We'll actually just steal that off of our old persistence of vision display. It's already wired up for us. A 16 channel input shift register for the switch inputs. This is for like what the ball hits, pushing the flipper buttons, etc a 16 channel output shift register for the coil outputs. This will control higher power things like the actual flippers. They'll use like solenoids. So yeah, we need a control for that. And a Mac 7221 seven segment LED driver. This is yet another chip that you shift data into and it will drive up to eight LED segments automatically. So instead of us having to constantly update them, this chip will do it for us. And the cool thing about all these is all of these are 16 bit wide. So we should be able to shift in and out all the data in one cycle during an interrupt using minimal pins. Let's get started. Amazing hacks. How can we make this portable? Inspired designs. I am the internet troll. Regrettable acting. Damn hatches! Each week, Element 14's The Ben Heck Show brings you innovative projects using electronics, engineering, and more. Felix, I got these um, door lock actuators online. Yeah. This is the kind of thing we need to control on the miniature pinball machine. I'll have you wire up a circuit. We'll have a little connector here, right? and there'll be a 12 volt rail line on one half of it. And then this will go to a, not gonna draw it perfectly correct here, but a MOSFET. And it will have a gate, a drain, and a source. A source basically goes to ground. The drain is where your load goes. So when you have a high on the gate, the drain allows is allowed to go to the source, to ground which will energize whatever this is. In this case, it's gonna be a coil. Yeah. So what I want you to do is um, hook up a bunch of MOSFETs, like eight, and then hook it to shift registers. So this will be on each one of the outputs of the shift register there. Add a pull down resistor, so its state is by default off. Up here, where the coil will go, add a flyback diode. You should always have a flyback diode on any sort of motor or solenoid because when, yeah, when the magnetic field collapses, the voltage can reverse and this will make it safe. So this will be the plug that will go to our individual coils and whatnot. So anyway, then just repeat this, um, I say at least eight. Okay. So hook up 16 bits of shift register just in case, but I think eight coils would be enough for this project. Sure. Make sense? Yeah. All right. While Felix gets the solenoid control wired up, I'm going to work on the display. I'm using a seven segment display and seven of them. So we can go up to 9,999,999 points. And this is a maximum 7221 LED driver. So what I'm gonna do is get this wired up. Uh, I'll wire all the digits in parallel going back to the driver. And then how this selects each module is it activates its cathode. So this works with common cathode LED modules. So it'll actually only have one on at a time, but this chip will do the multiplexing for us. 
This driver is a common cathode driver, which means it takes the common cathode of each module, or the ground, and sinks it, allowing that module to turn on. So what you do is you attach all the anodes in parallel, as you see I am doing right here. And those are all driven at the same time. But the module that turns on is the one that has its cathode sunk to ground. And that's how the driver controls which one is activated. It's called multiplexing. Only one of the modules is on at a time, but it's switched so quickly you can't see it with your human eye. I've wired up the seven segment displays to the MAX221 integrated circuit. Basically you have a common cathode on each display and that sinks into the chip. And then the chip drives the seven segments with positive voltage and whichever display it wants to be active, it pulls that common cathode low. The rest of them have a high common cathode. So it actually draws them one at a time. It just does it so rapidly you can't see it. But it's nice that the chip handles that instead of us having to do that. So going into it, we have clock, data in, latch, and ground. So it's basically like a big shift register. I'm gonna plug this into the Teensy, apply power to the LEDs, because I don't wanna try to power them off the USB bus. This timing diagram indicates how we should shift data into the LED controller. It's basically two bytes, or one short. The LSB, the first four bits, is going to be your number. And if you put a zero through nine into four bits, that's called BCD, binary coded decimal. So basically in the first byte, we put what number we want, zero to nine. In the second byte, we put what address we want. Uh, that indicates which segment we want to draw this digit into. There's also a few things when we boot up that we have to write into. We have to set a decode mode turn off, shut down, and set an intensity. This is the code I've started for the Teensy. I'm using a Teensy install on top of Arduino to drive it. So basically, if you wanna use a Teensy program like an Arduino, you download the Teensy Duino software and you run it and it'll install itself on top of your Arduino. So the things that are important here are the LED command, that's a uh, short, which digit, and that's which digit it's drawing score string, so this is like a string, I just have some numbers in there right now, zero through seven, and digit data. Down here, this mess is um, running in an interrupt, and so we can run several interrupts at a time on this Teensy, which is great. So this interrupt is gonna be doing all the shifting of data, so we can have a bunch of peripherals on only a few I.O. lines. I've got some of it commented out, but what it's doing is uh, 250 times a second, it clocks out 16, bits of data, so it updates these digits 256 times a second, but it only changes one of the digits every cycle. So up here at the beginning, it says, if LED command, then make the digit data the command, else make the digit data which digit we're trying to make, zero through seven, and then what the digit should be, which is the ASCII digit minus 48, so it becomes a number. So zero in ASCII is 48, you minus 48, and that actually gives you zero. Then right here, we're using the uh, low-level port functionality because it's faster, and we're clocking out the bits one by one, the 16 bits that we need to drive the LED. So we're going doo -doo 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 -doo. So it starts, clocks out the MSB first, and then it ends at the LSB. It's going to be clocking out other things on that same cycle, but we'll get to that later. So the reason I made this LED command thing here is because I wanna, I wanna be able to send commands to the LED, but there's already an interrupt running. So if I try to do that manually, I'm gonna interrupt the interrupt so to speak. So what I did up here is I made a command called send LED command. And uh, we can call this at the beginning of the code right here. These are where I'm sending the commands like the brightness, the scan rate, blah, blah, blah. This is all from the data sheet. So right here, we basically take LED command and we put in the two functions, the address and the data. So that's taking the LED command and making it something more other than zero. So every time the interrupt runs, it says, oh, is there something in the LED command? And if there is, then it's gonna send that LED command to the LED instead of the data we're trying to send. If there isn't an LED command, then it will just send the digit data, which is its normal state. And once it's uh, latch the command data, it then clears the command data, which means up here where it's sending the command, see how it sets the command, and then this waits until the command has been cleared or sent to the LED before it continues. The reason we do that is because if we send all of these in a row, they'd get bunched up on the interrupt and we'd send incomplete data. 
So basically, we're setting that we want uh, full brightness to start. Uh, we have seven digits. We're using the built-in uh, font, which is where we just send a zero when it displays a zero. And we have to set this address to one to enable the display. And then I did this other thing in here too, in the main loop where uh, uh, every 50 milliseconds it changes the brightness of the LEDs, because we can. All we have to do is send a command to the brightness register and it will change for us. Let's test it out. All right, we're sending data to the LED displays during an interrupt, 250 times a second. So in the main program, you don't have to worry about it. We have some static digits on the display. Now to make a score. Right here, I have a function called add score and it's gonna add 1,024 points. And there's also a variable called player equals one, which is the active player. Okay, so let's look at the add score. Add score is going to take the player score and add the score amount that you pass into it, plus the multiplier, of course. Then that's gonna call a function called make score. It's just gonna pass it a number. In a make score, it's going to have a divider, which starts at 1 million, and it's gonna uh, watch the size and a uh, zero flag as well. First, we clear the string. Um, if you wanna have a blank character on this display, it's actually 15 goes a zero to nine and then 15 or four ones actually means, you know, no, no character at all. And then what we do here is we basically go through each uh, digit, all eight of them, and we say, okay, um, if the score is larger than the divider, then put that single digit into memory, such as a two or a three, and then divide the score by the divider so we can look at the next digit. So if we're looking at the, like the number, uh, like this number, uh, 232,000, it will look at this, then it will look at this, then it will look at this, and figure out what the digits are in that fashion. Because to a computer, the number is a bunch of bytes. It doesn't look like that. So by doing this loop here, we take a number, as far as the computer understands it, and we divide it into uh, characters that we can understand. And those characters are put into the score string, and the score string is what is output during the interrupt to the display. Once we have all this programmed, it all happens behind the scenes. All we gotta do is say, add score 500 points, and then we don't have to worry about it. That's what's great about functions and functions calling other functions in your code. Next, I need to get some lights for this little pinball machine. And I realized I had this persistence of vision display from an older episode laying around, and it already has a PCB with a constant current LED driver built into it. And it uses shift register inputs, just like our LED driver does. So I tore a couple of units off of this, and I've got it hooked up to my Teensy. Let's test it out. This is basically a shift register, but it has a constant current driver on 16 lines for these LEDs. So it's very much like what's in there. We probably could use more of these Max uh, 7221 chips, but again, I have these laying around, so I'm going to use them. So it's got the same clock and latch lines as this, and we just have separate data lines. Now there's 16 of these lights, and as you recall, I clocked in 16 bits total, so we actually have one data line for this bank and another data line for this bank. So everything that's connected to this will be in pairs of 16. All right, so I'm gonna hook up the Teensy to the breadboard and we'll see if it works. We're gonna try to do everything at the same time. That way we know it'll all work. Hey, there they go. Now what I've got here is I've got some code that I actually pulled from my big pinball machine and it's all automatic. So you just say strobe zero three and it will strobe light zero three positions up. And we actually have one light blinking, a light strobing 15 positions, two lights strobing three positions. And of course we could just have lights that are solid on or off. So what I'll do is I'll take a few more of these modules and I'll remove all the LEDs from them and then we can 
implant those on our play field and then just directly wire them up to little LEDs that can light up the inserts like, oh, shoot here, uh, do this, blah, blah, blah. You know, it's all about using existing parts. Translation, old garbage. Felix wired up a solenoid driver for me. It has a switching five volt regulator on it, a switch so we can select whether the power for the Teensy comes from USB or the five volt regulator, two 74HC595 shift registers, so we can shift in bits and then put it out to parallel data. These are IRL530 MOSFETs. They can handle quite a bit of power. They're much bigger than we need for this project, but I had them laying around. And then we have some convenient plugs here for each of the solenoids. So we can have like flipper, flipper, ball loader, pop bumper. We probably won't even need all eight. So I put a super header on the Teensy here. Let me explain the parts. The Teensy is here. This is an audio shield that Felix found. We're going to use this to play sound effects and music. It has an SD card on it. You can play audio without a shield on the Teensy, but you get slightly better resolution using this audio shield. Then I've connected pins for everything I could find at the bottom of the unit, even in the middle, and it mates up to the board here. These cables go to the display that we showed earlier, and it can be disconnected. So now we can control solenoids with this. Again, we're taking it one step at a time. Let's show it on the computer. I bought these solenoids from Element 14, and I bought a couple different sizes. I bought this small one here. I don't know if these will actually be useful for the machine, but you know, I'm gonna give it a try. And I made this rig, uses that larger solenoid that you saw, and see where we have the spring? The spring pushes the rod out and then it act actuates a lever. I don't know if I'll use this necessarily on the machine, but it's just a test piece that I did. But we can use it for an example. So I'm gonna plug this into a 12 volt supply. And I'm gonna switch it over so the Teensy has power. And it's going to add 200 points and kick the solenoid at the same time. Plug it in to position 15. Cool. Okay, obviously we're not gonna use that power supply for the final unit, but it definitely shows that this part works. Now onto switches. Now we need switch inputs, like the user pressing the button or the ball hitting things. We're going to use shift registers for this again, but we use shift input registers. The shift registers we use for the solenoids, you clock bits out to them and then you latch it, and then those bits appear on the output. These are the opposite. Um, you apply zeros and ones to the shift registers, then when you latch it, that data is put onto the bus, and then when you clock it, that data comes into your microcontroller. So it kind of works the same way, just in reverse. I'm using 4021 BEs because, you know, I've used them before and we have a whole bucket full. There will be pull-up resistors for each one of the lines, and I'm going to attach four Molex plugs, so we'll have like ground and then three signals, ground and three signals, ground and three signals, making it easier to wire to different parts of the board. So um, I'll try to make this thing all modular so you can actually open it up and unplug it, and you know, it'll be easy to work on. All right, so I'm gonna wire the shift registers to the pull-up resistors and the Molex connectors. First, I attach pull-up resistors to each one of the inputs. This makes sure that the input is constant, usually a one or high, but when you close the switch, it will go low to zero. I then attach each one of the pull-up resistors to the inputs on the shift registers. There are eight inputs per shift register, two shift registers in series, a total of 16 inputs. I also tie together the clock, data, and latch lines. With the shift registers installed, it's time to add code for them. Here is our main loop to get the input output. And again, this runs an interrupt. And I don't want this to be too long, but we should be okay. Right here, when we start it, we set cab temp to zero. Cab temp is a short, which means it's 16 bits and eight bits, two shift registers, 16 bits. So what happens is every time we clock the bits, we shift cab temp one to the left to make an opening at the beginning. And then after we do the clock with these other things, we put the data on the line and then set the clock. Well, the cab, we actually wanna get the bits after we clock it. So see how right here, this is the things that happen between the clocks and this happens after the clock. So after the clock occurs, we get whatever bit is on that port and we're using low level port access. See this GPIO EPDR? And we actually get that information from the data sheet for the main Freescale chip itself. 
the DIR register, which is this one. I've found on the data sheet, you know, pin 31 is PTE zero, so it's port E bit zero. So in that case, we're actually looking at this bit right here. So how we do that mathematically is we do cab temp or equals that port N1. So whatever is in the first bit, we mask off everything else, and then we put that in the LSB of cab temp, and then we shift cab temp to the left, leaving a spot for the next bit. All right, so let's do an example. Uh, let me get the serial monitor here. I have it outputting the uh, binary. Also, you can see that I've inverted it. We have pull-up resistors on each one of these pins, which means by default they're one, and when you close a switch, they go to zero. But for logic purposes in code, it's a lot easier for something to be one. So you can be like, if switch is anything, then do something. So that's why I invert them. So I'm gonna to touch these pins here and we should see ones and zeros, there we go. So we have 16 switches to work with. Uh, it's a small little machine, that, that should be fine. The next thing I wanna do is actually create a, a switch function. So over here, it's pretty simple. I'm not gonna put debounce in this, I don't think it really needs it. When you call a cab switch, you say cab switch and then you call either zero to 15 as the argument you pass into it for you know, the 16 switches. And what it'll do is it'll return the cabinet uh, variable that has been bit shifted the number of switches to the right and it ands it with one. So if you're looking for position 15, it shifts it 15 to the right, which puts it in the LSB and then it ands it with one and that's what it returns. Oh, one more thing I should mention here. We have cab temp equals zero and that's the a variable that we build the bits in as we get it. But then once it's complete, we copy, we copy that to cabnet. The reason we do that is since this is an interrupt, you don't know when exactly it might get accessed. So if you accessed cab temp, you might see the bits in a weird place. So by copying it every cycle to the variable cabinet, it'll never change. It's kind of like vSync when you see screen tearing on your PC game, kind of the same thing. You wanna make sure that it's synced up. So that's why we actually copy it to cabinet once we're done. All right, so I did a little code here. If cab switch zero is anything, then say switch zero was hit. Let's see if it works. Hey, there we go. Cool. So now we have working switches and a little function that makes it a little easier to use them. It does the bitwise operations for us. You can do things like, um, what is it, read bit with a teensy, but when you call those functions like read bit or digital write, it goes into a much larger function that you don't see, but it is indeed there, usually inside some sort of H file. And there'll be a bunch of logic and a bunch of parameters which accommodate all sorts of different development boards. Anyway, that can slow it down. So anytime you can do it with direct uh, low level port access like we are right here, all these ports being cleared, C and S set, you should because it's gonna be a lot faster. You just have to think about it a little bit more. This is the audio shield for the Teensy 3.1. It has a DAC built into it, which gives it slightly better audio capabilities than the Teensy has by itself. And there's also a slot for an SD card. I downloaded some sample files from the Teensy 3.1 website. So I renamed them AA0, AA1, AA2, so they'll be easy to access in a program. So I'm just gonna plug this onto the stacker for the Teensy. Now there's a cool online program that you can go to for the Teensy audio shield. It's the audio system design tool. You add the objects that you want, such as the ISS1, which is the Teensy uh, audio shield, and then you add things to it in a flowchart like manner. So we want a play wave file, because we want to play waves. See so yeah, how there's two nodes on that? That's for left and right audio. Let's add another play wave file so we can play two sounds simultaneously. Now here's the cool part. We're going to get the mixer. And the mixer can add up to four inputs and make them into one output. Now we actually need two mixers because we're gonna do this in stereo. Oh, we also need the uh, object. Here we go. This represents the uh, DAC that we have on the audio card. All right, so now we can put this together. Check this out, so we go whoop. So we put the left channel there into that. So we're combining the left channels and then we put the output into the left channel of our audio device. And then we do the same thing with the right channel. 
you might think, okay, this is just a visual representation. What good does it do us? But we just go to export and then look at this. It gives us the code to put into our sketch for the connections we just did. So we just copy this and we go into our code and we paste it. So it gives us all the appropriate include files and it sets everything up. So we have the two wave players, the two mixers and the output and these patch cord objects, that's basically telling it how to put everything together. Uh, yeah, so that will give us what we need. In the setup here, we're going to enable it and then set a volume. I'll set it to all the way up so we can hear the headphones easily. Uh, yeah, and I've created a string SFX file name with a, what would that be, seven characters? So three character file name, the dot, and then wave. So we'll set the first part of that right there, but then we'll change it when we call this function. So what we can call from our loop or anywhere else is this play SFX function. And I again, kind of copied this from my other pinball machine that I made. Uh, when you call play SFX, there's a channel, file name, and then the priority. The priority is important because you want some sound effects to not interrupt other sound effects and then some should. So basically when we call this, we say if the priority, if, if there is something playing, so basically we ask it if something's playing. And if the priority of this channel is greater than the priority that's coming in, then we, I just have the priority reject, so it won't let it do it. Otherwise, we play the clip. We, um, we pass this into the variable, folder clip clip, and then we go to play wave, which channel play SFX file name. So when we call that, uh, we'll either get a one or a zero. If we get a zero, that means the file wasn't found. But if we get it, then we say okay. Then right here, we basically have a wait loop. We wait for it to start playing before we return control back to the program because there's a slight delay as it finds the file and starts the file. So you don't want anything else to happen. I mean, it's just like microseconds, but you still don't want anything to happen in that time. So as an example, we're going to play one sound, wait half a second, and then start another. And we should hear them playing at the same time. Let's give it a try. I've added a few more things to the code. Uh, I've hooked up four different switches we can do. So we can play random sound effects, stop the music, flip a solenoid, or start the music. Right here, um, I have a call in the main loop. If music is playing, flag equals yes, and music is no longer playing, then restart the music. So what happens is if you um, start something in channel one, and there's two channels, channel zero and one, if you start something in channel one, it's considered to be music. So it sets the music playing flag to one and then stores what clip you called in a variable. So if the music stops, it'll immediately restart it. Let's see what we can do. We can play sound effects. We can start music. We can stop music and we can activate the coil. The electronics are all done for the portable pinball project. That's all the time we have for this episode. In a future episode, two weeks from now, we'll come back to finish this project by building a play field, making mechanical toys and actuators to install onto it, and connect those to the electronics to make a complete working miniature pinball machine. We'll see you then. I like to eat garbage. Next, I need some insert lights for this miniature, I almost said possum machine. <laughs> hey, we should make a possum themed pinball. We should just change the theme again. The Ben Heck Show is brought to you by Element 14, the electronic design community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com.